Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain and we are on day 2349 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. We are continuing the messages I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church this year. This is the fourth of a five Lenten Easter message series titled, He Comes Riding on a Donkey. I pray that it'll be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. <clears throat> Today, we continue with our five-week Lenten series messages ending next week on Resurrection Sunday, March 31st. And today our message is, He comes riding on a donkey. And our scripture passage today is John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. It's on page 1671 of your pew Bibles if you'd like to follow along. The next day, the great crowd had come to the festival because they heard Ju Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first the disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did he realize that these things had been written about him and that these things must be done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now most of us enjoy parades, attending them, being part of them. Now we used to have ticker tape parades. They're not common as they once were, primarily because <clears throat> they don't use ticker tape anymore. They use electronic and that's hard, sort of hard to use in a parade. But there was a time where our country honored those heroes and heroines in colossal spectacular parades. Celebrities would ride in convertibles down these massive canyons of steel and glass and wave to people as they went by. Bands played rousing Sousa marches. Young ladies tossed their batons and waved their pom-poms. <laughs> Tons of confetti, streamers, balloons, and ticker tape cascaded down upon them as they went through this parade. Everybody was there. Everybody loves a good parade. It was a time of great excitement. Now, growing up, there was a, a cartoon which was Peabody and Sherman, and they had a Wayback Machine. I think I mentioned this maybe once before, but let's get in our Wayback Machine today and step back 2,000 years to the city of Jerusalem, and we see a crowd gathering. A mass of humanity, humanity was present. If you look at your bulletin insert on the side, it says, he comes riding on a donkey, because today... We want to be in the heart of Jerusalem, spectators of this parade, the most significant parade in the history of humankind. Perhaps two and a half million people were crowding into that city of Jerusalem that week. Those narrow streets converging on that holy city because it was Passover week. And many came to Jerusalem that week. From a distance came a noise. It was kind of rhythmic staccato noise. It was a chant that's waffling in as we stand there observing this crowd from our Wayback Machine. It gets louder and louder. It's coming from the southern gate of the city. People stop talking to each other. They turn their faces toward their, where that sound was coming. Their ears were peaked toward that sound. They're trying to figure out what it was. Then they heard, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. It was more like a cheer than it was a chant. And as the procession approached, we see that the dust is rising now from the feet of so many people that are gathering. Men pushed and shoved to get closer to the street. The Hosannas got louder and louder. 
reverberating against those stone walls of the buildings that they were passing by. A man comes running ahead of this procession, and he's saying something to the people, and they, we strain to hear it. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. The prophet is coming. The man who raised the dead is coming. Jesus, hurry, hurry. Jesus is coming. The crowd began to inch closer and closer to the streets. Dad hoisted their children on their shoulders so they could see. Teenagers climbed the trees that were lining the road just to get an unhindered view. Everyone wanted to get a, just a glimpse of this strange prophet that they've heard so much about. What they saw was somewhat strange, or at least totally unexpected. Jesus moved serenely on the back of a little white donkey, much like a man riding in a convertible in a ticker tape parade. Jesus was the honored celebrity that day, the much like the, the center of this, this attention, the eye of the hurricane, you might say. Around him continually was chaos. But within him, as we saw and observed him, as we observe him from that perspective, is calmness. Rather than the sound of confetti trickling down, you could hear the slashing and whooshing of palm branches, a sign of national identity. Yes, Israel, Israel, Israel. We are God's chosen people. They were placed in front of the donkey along the road. Before Jesus, others that were at the crowd placed their coats or their mats before Jesus to ride down that street of Jerusalem that day. They rolled out a red carpet for Jesus. The coats made that mosaic color. It was an incredible scene. Yes, as we observe in our mind's eye what must have been taking place that day, I would have loved there to be there that day for that gala event. Although I wouldn't necessarily want to be the street sweeper that had to follow up afterwards. You see, on that day, all segments of humanity were present on that Palm Sunday, the procession of Jesus that day. And do you know how I know? I know because of what was left in the streets after Jesus passed by. You can tell a lot about a person by what they leave behind. If you'd go out throughout Devola on trash day and look through people's trash, you could tell a lot about the family just by what they leave behind. So you look in your bulletin insert, we see that first of all, the uninformed were there. The innocent passerbyers had never seen Jesus before. They did not recognize him now, but they found themselves caught up in this procession. Many were travelers. They were pilgrims, and they came with their, their burlap bags. They might have entered Jerusalem early that morning to go to the market to do some shopping. Or maybe they had planned a family outing on the Mount of Olives with a picnic. They knew nothing about what was coming. They didn't expect Christ to come into that town that day. But they were at the right place at the right time. They simply got caught up in that historic moment of that day when Christ entered that city. And let me tell you a story that happened much more recently than that. Several years ago, a family was vacationing in Florida near Cape Canaveral while NASA was still using the space shuttles to shuttle astronauts back and forth to the International Space Station. Now, this family had a daughter, and she just loved this space and rocket museum, and the family loved to go on those tours of NASA. They spent the first several days at the beach, but then they decided to have a change of pace. The family departed early that morning, anticipating going to the NASA Visitor Center right when it opened. They wanted to be the first ones there. But when they turned off of I-95 onto State Route 528 heading toward the Cape, they found themselves in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. The last time they went to the NASA Center, it was a breeze. They went right in. But on this day, it was different. There must have been a lot of people going to the Visitor's Flight Center that day, they thought. 
They inched and crawled their way for about an hour, wondering why so many people were going to the Space Center on this particular day. As they moved closer and closer in their car, just a little bit by little bit, they noticed some of the people were starting to pull off the road and park their cars. Others were getting out of their cars and standing there. Others were laying out blankets on this grassy knoll beside the road. And they had picnic baskets out. Others had cameras hanging from their necks. Others had their binoculars. And they were looking off into the distance. And then it hit them. In unison, the family says, oh, a shuttle launch must be scheduled for this day. They asked someone, and he confirmed their suspicion. It was 9.53 now, and at 10 o'clock, the shuttle was scheduled to take off. So they quickly pulled the car off the side of the road, got out of their car, went up on that grassy knoll, and they watched that space shuttle jettison up into the heavens. Miraculous sign. And like this family serendipitous experience with the shuttle, many of those pilgrims that day in Jerusalem were there for the Passover. They were uninformed. They were unaware that Christ would be coming into town that day, that Jesus, that healer. They were just innocent bystanders, caught up in that moment of that day. They had not planned for this event. They had planned to go shopping in Jerusalem prior to the Passover. They just happened to be present that day when the parade came by. Now, the family in our story on that summer day at Cape Canaveral were unexpectedly surprised at a chance to see the space shuttle launch into outer space. In the same manner, those uninformed people were in Jerusalem that day, and they were glad that their paths had crossed the paths of Jesus Christ. They were awed by that majesty in that moment. It was more than just the crowds that were around them that were abuzz with excitement, more than the chanting, more than the chaos that was around them. It was the man at the center of it all. It was the Christ. It was the chosen one. It was the Messiah that Israel longed for for centuries. They see Jesus and look on him with wonder. He has countenance of compassion in his face. They see in him a face of a friend. They are enthralled by his determined pace, by his purposeful steps as he goes through this on the parade. And at that moment, they want what he has. Far too long, they had wandered aimlessly and traveled meanlessly. Now they see what they have sought, this man riding in on a donkey. They were caught unawares, but in that instant, they changed. They dropped their bags that they were carrying around into the road. As a royal procession, they dropped their cloaks or their mats into the road. As a royal procession, as Jesus came by, they were enthralled. They had given him what few possessions that they had. And then they followed Jesus throughout the parade. As we're there observing from our Wayback Machine, we see another group of people in the crowd. These were the poor, and they tagged along the Lord wherever he went. At that parade, it was the penniless that sang the Hosannas the loudest. They loved Jesus, and why not? Jesus gave them the one thing that the world could not give them, and that was hope. The hope for a better today, studded with grace and mercy and forgiveness, and the hope of a brighter tomorrow. Some of these people were homeless, but it was filled with the hope of having an eternal home with God in heaven. It was waiting for them. That hope that they had all but lost here on earth was restored in Jesus Christ. That's what the poor felt that day. They were outcast by their society. They were downtrodden by the wealthy of the country. They were despised by the ruling class. So when Jesus entered that city riding on a donkey, the symbol of a lower class of citizen, a donkey, they immediately identified with him as their savior. The poor blanketed the robe, the robe with what little they had. They had not much. 
but the shirt's on their backs and maybe an extra robe, just a torn and tattered robe, and they laid it in the streets for Jesus to proceed on. They realized that they themselves could not get to heaven in their own merit. They didn't even have a robe to spare, but they were willing to lay that robe in the path of Christ as he marched into that city. In lowering their torn and tattered cloaks to the ground, they humbled themselves, becoming poor in spirit to reap the rewards of a heavenly merit. They declared themselves spiritually bankrupt. Their pockets were empty. They had nothing else to give. Their options were gone. They stopped demanding justice and begged for mercy. Only then could they have that hope of salvation that day. Because on the road to Jerusalem that day, the poor found hope. They found life. They found the riches of heaven. Then on the other side of your bulletin insert today, we see, as we observe this crowd in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, another group of people. Because the zealots were there. That political class was present too, the zealots. They were hired mercenaries. They were Israelites, dedicated to the nation of Israel, but they were hired mercenaries. And they were incited that day. Despicable Romans, they thought. They despised their arrogance of the ruling Roman government. They hated their pagan practices and beliefs, their gods and goddesses, their debauchery. They had a look of rage in their eyes as we observed them like one preparing for battle. They carried in their belts sharp daggers ready to fight. They were ready to serve justice to the Romans. If in by, by, by chance, they would slip up behind the Roman soldiers and slit his throat and disappear into the crowd before anyone knew what was going on. They wouldn't know who completed that dastardly deed. You might say they were the original terrorists of that day. The zealots saw in Jesus, who they had heard about so much about, the fulfillment of their desire to be free from tyranny. They saw Jesus as their liberator, whom they believed would bring a freedom fight, a fight for freedom to the occupiers and the dominators of that, the nation of Israel. Jesus would be their conquering king. They're ruling monarch. So they welcomed Jesus as they heard he was coming before they saw him. And they would wave their palm branches as a sign of national unity to Israel. 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 God's chosen people. It was an open invitation to their their restorer, to that Christ coming in to free them from the tyranny of Rome. They were ready to do battle. And with a single word from Christ, From Jesus, they would have fought to the death against those Romans. They wanted to make Israel great again. But something bothered them when they saw Christ approach on that fateful day. They saw Jesus riding on a donkey. A conquering king would ride in on a stallion, a symbol of victory. Not a donkey, the symbol of peace. Jesus was offering people peace. They wanted war. These folks wanted revolution, not redemption. They desired a deliverance from those hated Romans, not freedom from sin. They or, the orders never came from Christ, though. But instead, the realization of their destructive ways dawned on them. So they pulled out their daggers from their sheaths on their hips. They dropped them into the road in front of Jesus. They took their palm fronds, a sign of national unity, of victory of Israel, and they placed them on the road as Jesus rode by. They entered the procession behind Jesus, following him. They were still ready to fight, but not for war of hatred and violence, but for the battle for love and peaceful nonviolence. And as we're there observing this crowd once again, we see another group of people. But they're standing a little bit off the parade route. These were the Pharisees that were there. 
The powerful Pharisee stood back with an air of a watchful eye, glaring at Jesus of what he was doing. They were the narrow-minded, the prejudiced, the intolerant, the religious folks with their noses stuck in the air. Oh, to be like me. Jesus, by and large, up to this point, had not ministered in the big crowds. He avoided the large crowds whenever he could. He refused to take on the air of those contemporary leaders who dominated through power in their stance, through religious domination. But on that day, Jesus Christ put on the symbols of the Old Testament prophetic utterances. His posture and his bearing declared to know under certain terms to these Pharisees, I am the king. He even picked a day that they would know very well. It was the Feast of the Unleavened Bread that celebrated the Jews' deliverance from the nation of Egypt and their bondage of Egypt. It marked the beginning of the wheat harvest. Jesus Christ's exposure to those ev- the Pharisees was evident that day. Only one problem. He picked the day not so much to gain the admiration of the crowds that were there that day, but to force the whole issue to these Pharisees, to those religious people, the whole reason for him coming to earth. His triumphal entry into Jerusalem would seal his doom. It was a calatic agent that aroused the anger of the religious establishment to a frenzy setting up the stage to the most significant event in all of human history. You see, those Pharisees that day had picked up stones. They brought these stones with them in their hands. The Pharisees knew what Jesus was doing. That's why they commanded Jesus to tell his disciples to stop calling him the king in Luke chapter 19, verse 39. But Jesus' voice pierced the ear, the air in verse 40 of Luke 19. He says, if they kept quiet... The stones along the road would burst into cheer. You see, most of the stones were baseball-sized stone. The very stones the Pharisees carried in their hands that day. The stones they used to stone people who did not keep the law or adhere to their doctrine. The rocks were caressed by the ones that wanted to stone Jesus. But they didn't have the guts to do it that day because of the crowds that were there. The rocks that they loved to hurl at anyone to whom they found fault. But there were a few among that crowd of Pharisees that day that ended up dropping their stones along the path where Jesus trod. They abandoned along the road where Jesus traveled. The stones were not thrown at Jesus though they were brought to do that at that parade that day. The stones fallen gently by a few of the Pharisees who the message of Jesus Christ had pierced their hearts. And they finally realized and understood who Jesus Christ was. They dropped their stones and followed Jesus. Those stones would cry out the power of Christ to change lives. As we look around once more, we see one more group of people that are there today. Those were the infirm, those who had had been infirmed in the past. They were there. But we have to look around a little bit to catch these people. Dotted in the crowd in Jerusalem on that day were people that were passionate about Jesus because of what he had done for them. And for good reason. They cheered and screamed the loudest in their praises. Ah, we need to spot in the crowd. Bartimaeus, that blind man whom Jesus healed in Jericho just a week before. He no longer had the need for those dirty gauze patches that once covered his eyes to cover the hideousness of his eyes. And Bartimaeus dropped his dirty rags in the road before Jesus to be trampled underfoot by the one who gave him sight. Ah, uh, we look around once more. Oh, we point, and then we see the man who had laid lame for 38 years by this, the pool, the sheep pool in Jerusalem, 
just waiting for 38 years for an uh, angel to heal him. Then Jesus came by one day and touched him. And his wonder-working power healed that man. That formerly lame man had no lo longer a need for his wooden crutches, so he tossed him into the road as Jesus proceeded on. A sign that Jesus had conquered his infirmities. Ah, we see over here in the crowd, the man who had, had once had a withered arm, whose arm was wrapped in path bundles and bandages because it was so grotesque to look at. He no longer had a need for those wrappings and patches, those pus-filled rags that were on his arms, and he laid them before Christ as he walked by on that day because he had been healed completely. One more person we spot in the crowd. Oh, he's just down there a little ways on the parade route. Yes, is it? Oh, it's Lazarus. With tears streaming down his face. Tears of joy. Because he is once dead. But he is now alive. And beside Lazarus, on both sides of Lazarus was two of Jesus' best friends, Mary and Martha standing there with him that day. Friends, those who were once infirmed were part of that crowd on that parade that day. No wonder they cried and danced and shouted and sang and smiled and laughed that day. Because the one who rides in on the donkey before them is their healer, their miracle worker. Their lives have been transformed forever. They cannot contain their joy and their excitement on that day when they see Christ run right into the city of Jerusalem. Have you ever felt the healing touch of Jesus? Has that wonder-working power of Jesus changed your life? If you have, then you know what Bartimaeus felt like. We know what the crippled man felt like. We know what that wounded man felt like. And if you've ever entrusted your life to Jesus, you've received the gift of eternal life. We know how Lazarus felt too. Because we were once dead, but now we're alive. So as that trumpeter that came before the parade, I say to you, hurry, the parade is coming. Hurry, you have a chance to be part of this parade. Hurry, he who came as a man, the God-man, who ever overcome death, who could heal the broken, who could restore sight to the blind. The one who raised the dead is on his way. You see, the church, you and I, together, are continuing that procession today. The parade that started just outside of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago to march through history over and over again. That's what the church is. We're a part of that parade that Jesus started that day 2,000 years ago as he marched into their road into the city. We're part of that. Each week when we meet as a gathering of believers, we're part of that parade. Each day when we wake up and say, thank you, Lord, we're part of that parade of Jesus riding into that city of Jerusalem to his final destiny here on earth, what well, was just the beginning of his destiny throughout all eternity. If you look at the graphic at the bottom of that page of your bulletin insert, ask yourself, where are you in this crowd? And another question, what do you bring to the parade today? Jesus will take your coats, your palm branches, your daggers, your rocks. He wants your crutches, your bandages, our patches. He'll take the brokenness of our lives and put it back together again. He'll take the trash of your sin and make you clean and pure. He'll take your spiritual poverty and make you eternally rich. He'll take your lifeless today and give you a resurrected tomorrow. He is the hope of the world. He is the hope of your life. So the question we leave you with today, what will you give to Jesus today? He's passing by right now. 
He's looking your way. Are you willing to look into his eyes? Take him by his hand and make him your king and your Lord every single day. Because Jesus, he comes riding on a donkey. The next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, a blessed day, probably the most blessed day of the year, I think. And our focus will be on He is Risen. In the message title, Blessed Are You Who Have Not Yet Seen and Yet Believe. So for next week, please read John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31 in preparation for next week's message. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for our Savior, our Lord, our Messiah, our Chosen One, Jesus Christ, who came riding into the city of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago on the back of a donkey. As the crowd shouted, Hosanna, the King of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us rise every day and declare, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, let us sing our hosannas loud and our hosannas strong. We give you thanks for your blessedness, for this story that we could share today of this special day. And as we prepare for next week of Resurrection Sunday, that our hearts might be in tune with the ultimate sacrifice that you provided for us, Father, on the cross this week. Help us to be ever thankful. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.